surf spot in a far-flung corner of Africa. With the lure of perfect waves. But there's a catch. There have been six deaths. Sharks are eating humans here, and the reasons are unknown. Now, biologist Matt Dickin must find answers. But the work is dangerous, and he needs to act quickly before the beach claims another victim. Day, summer, the east coast of South Africa. Zama Indemaze has been surfing for three hours. His brother and cousin are with him. At 16, he's just been selected for the state surfing team. He has a big future ahead of him. The others tire and paddle for shore. Zama stays to catch one last wave. But something is watching him. clamps down on his foot. His cousin Karibo turns and tries to help. He's just become the fifth victim of Second Beach. Nestled among sheer cliffs, scenic headlands, and legendary rough seas, Second Beach on Africa's east coast was a surfer's best kept secret. This shark attack story is unique. Usually, sharks leave survivors. But here, all six victims have been killed or eaten. The 100% death rate of Second Beach is unprecedented. Some of the tribal people living on the surrounding hills believe they have been cursed by the ancestral spirits that live in the sea. Others are just frightened by this deadly and mysterious invasion. Once bustling, Second Beach now stands deserted and under guard. The people want their beach back. But before that can happen, they first need answers. Shark biologist Dr. Matt Dickin has been investigating. But this is challenging work. Second Beach is so remote, no research has been done here. Port St. John's is almost a black hole of information. It's so remote, it's so rural, it's so difficult to work here that the fact is, apart from anecdotal accounts, we know so little about the sharks in this area. 
Matt knows that humans usually aren't on a shark's menu, and fatal attacks are exceedingly rare. But every now and then, sharks mysteriously deviate from their natural prey, with devastating results. Previous case studies do exist. Brazil's Recife coast saw sharks attacking 89 people, killing 21 over 80 years. Recently, Western Australia saw an alarming 11 attacks in one year, with five fatalities. Back across the globe, Durban on South Africa's coast exploded in panic in 1957 when sharks killed another five people. Reason enough to open a forensic lab in South Africa. Research here helped identify the species of killer sharks in the 1957 attacks. Got a real dilemma. What did the municipality do? So Matt makes the lab his first stop. Shark crime scene investigator Dr. Jeremy Cliff knows what clues to look for after a shark attack. You, you notice here on the tiger jaw how the teeth are very much angled to the side. Each species of shark creates a unique bite pattern. Serrations on the edges of these teeth. Again, you're going to looking for really clean bite marks from white sharks. Tiger sharks have identical teeth on both jaws, serrated and close together. Great whites have big gaps between their teeth and the upper jaw has wider teeth. Bull sharks have broad, cutting teeth on the top jaw and smaller, flesh-tearing teeth on the bottom. These bite prints will help Matt and Jeremy ID Zama's killer. As Zama is paddling, he feels something bite his foot. Pulled off the board and then grabbed on the upper leg. It's going to engulf his entire leg. That's right. And I can imagine the loss of tissue, the blood loss that's going to result from a bite like this. By matching the bite pattern on the body to actual shark jaws, Jeremy identifies a possible suspect the bull shark. These are highly aggressive animals, so this species is a logical fit. It's one of the most dangerous tropical sharks. They have an indiscriminate appetite and will pursue prey into very shallow water. On this coastline, bull sharks track big shoals of barracuda that move inshore in summer, putting them alarmingly close to human activity. Matt now has one suspect in his sights. He travels to the scene of the crime in search of witnesses. That's cool. He needs to find out if other sharks are involved. Well, and more importantly, why they're attacking humans in the first place. But instead of finding answers, he's presented with bizarre local theories. Some people suspect that the sharks lurking near the beach by day are summoned by tribal ceremonies at night. Witchcraft is part of everyday life here. Medicine men perform sacrifice rituals on the beach. It's feared that blood from the slaughtered animals attracts sharks. Sharks have been referred to as swimming noses. Their nostrils aren't for breathing, only for smelling. They channel water into nares, folded nasal cavities that can sense blood from 800 meters away. 
They can sniff out one part blood in one million parts seawater. Very effective when it comes to finding prey. Matt soon discovers that people are indeed killing animals on the beach. The animals are used as offerings, but the slaughtering only takes place high up on the sand, well away from the water. The blood and guts don't make it into the ocean. So the rumors that these sacrifices attract sharks seem unfounded. But there's another, even more unusual theory on why sharks come here to hunt. Nighttime beach parties often include tribal drumming sessions. Sharks have legendary hearing. Could they be attracted by this low frequency thumping? Hairs in the shark's ear pick up low pitched sounds. We'd both hear the deepest notes on a piano. But struggling fish give off a deeper thudding. Less than 300 hertz. That's what sharks are most responsive to. Matt takes a frequency reading. The result is intriguing. The drums are in the 250 hertz range, well within the shark's hearing spectrum. Crashing waves of Second Beach almost certainly drown out the drumming before it reaches the sea. So this theory is also unlikely. But there's an even weirder one waiting in line. Six years ago, a whale supposedly washed up on the beach, and its rotting carcass was buried in the sand to stop the smell. Would a whale carcass bleeding festering blubber into the sea attract sharks? Absolutely. Most species of sharks spend their days hunting fish, but catching them isn't easy. Fish are fast. And a frantic chase only scores a morsel. Not much payoff for the effort. So sharks will choose carrion whenever they can find it. The smell of a dead whale is like ringing a shark's dinner bell. Still, Matt is skeptical. A whale carcass buried six years ago is unlikely to attract sharks after such a long time. Besides, he can't find a single person to confirm the whale burial rumor. He's investigated the local theories and found them all dead in the water. It's time to look for clues in the other attacks. Summer 2007. Lifeguard Sibulela Masiza heads out for a training swim at Second Beach. He swims out to deep water and never returns. A 
swim fin is all that's found. But it's enough for Dr. Cliff to ID the culprit. In having a look at these pictures, I can see... A small a slice in the case, rubber leaves an important honest, clue. Not much to go on. Matt and Jeremy know that different sharks leave distinctive bites. responsible for those bite patterns. We thought in this particular case that it might well have been a tiger, just looking at some of the, um, of the incisions in the fin. Mm. A new suspect emerges, the tiger shark. It's a species that's known to consume anything, which fits this case where the victim was never found. They're known as the garbage bins of the sea. Combine this indiscriminate feeding habit with its large size, up to five and a half meters. And that makes it a very dangerous species of shark. Tiger sharks prefer warm water, but so do swimmers. When predators and people vie for the same balmy spot in the ocean, that's a problem. But despite the attacks, surfers still head for Second Beach. The pull of waves is just too much for them. A classic case of, it'll never happen to me. Matt notices a coincidence here. Five years ago, a surf school started on the beach, and the sport grew more popular. Local surfers grew more talented and more and more took up the sport. Before long, surfing was the cool thing to do. For added safety, a lifeguard station was set up, and Second Beach became the only easily accessible lifeguarded swimming beach for over a hundred miles. For more and more locals, it was the best place to swim. But that's when the spate of attacks began. More people in the water inevitably leads to more encounters with sharks. But what's drawing the sharks here in the first place? That's what Matt needs to find out. One possibility lies half a mile away, where the powerful Umzimvubu River empties into the sea. Brown, sediment-laden water mixes with the ocean to form a filthy slick. Bull and tiger sharks, both the key suspects, are found offshore. They love dirty water, where they can disappear into the filth to hunt. But of all the dangerous sharks, only the bull sharks swim up rivers. And the river near Second Beach is on their route map. In summer, when the attacks happen, high rainfall flushes warm, muddy water into the estuary. The prevailing north wind blows it straight towards Second Beach.
The silt and algae form a rich soup that nourishes smaller reef fish. Bigger fish come to eat the small fish. Then, even bigger predators arrive. And ultimately, sharks. Matt suspects that the bull sharks, which swim upriver, might be staying for the feast, which draws them and tiger sharks closer to the shore. January 2009. The start of Second Beach's most deadly year. 27-year-old Bangaliswe is an off-duty lifeguard. He's off for a swim to cool down. The water is murky today. But he's not alone on the beach. He's in good shape, a strong swimmer. But he's also Victim number three, his friends see red water, but he screams once. The details are too gruesome to portray. Really nasty attack, repeated mauling of the body. So we suspect that it was a, a bull shot. Pattern is forming. The bull shark is a suspect once again. All one can say is we're dealing with highly aggressive and highly determined sharks at Port St. John's. When shark bites man, it's often a case of mistaken identity. But something is driving these sharks past innocent investigation, making them more determined to feed on humans. Just two months have passed since Bangaliseway's death. A heavy swell strikes Second Beach. A young surfer, Luyolo, throws caution aside. He's 16, a student at the surfing school. His coach is with him. Luyolo takes a breather between waves. He paddles out a little further. Makes it back to the beach, but he's been bitten badly. He bleeds out on the sand. Matching the bites in forensics reveal that again, the bull shark is to blame. The, the bites were a lot cleaner, but again, the thing that struck me about it was that there was multiple bites. Here was a highly aggressive shark it came back time and time again to attack the victim. As this pattern of aggressive attacks continues, Matt formulates his own theory. 
Nearby Port St. John's is a seaside town. It's growing rapidly, and all the effluent drains into the river. This river is a half mile away, but Second Beach has two smaller rivers of its own, which also leak sewage and organic waste from the town directly into the ocean. The scent of human waste must be strong. This could be the shark's fatal attraction. Before the summer is over, trouble returns to Second Beach. 22-year-old Nduvo, another lifeguard, is out training. He's being watched, but he should be safe. He's on a big paddleboard. He paddles in and out to sea, over and over. Again, lifeguard Gerald Intercati witnesses the attack. But there's nothing he can do. This third fatal attack of the year leaves no trace, no clues, just empty ocean. The victim disappeared. So unfortunately, we've just got nothing to go on with, with that attack. The suspect could be a bull or tiger shark, but Matt suspects a number of other species too. Second Beach is on the edge of a shark highway. Every winter, the world's largest shoal of sardines migrates past Second Beach, attracting sharks that come to feast. Among them, a big, dusky shark, though they usually stay further out to sea. the south come bronze whalers. They all meet here to feed on sardines. If any of these deep sea predators stay for the summer, they could pose as great a danger as the bull and tiger sharks. to find a way to keep tabs on his suspects. Somehow, he must literally tail the sharks. If Matt hopes to solve the shark attacks at Second Beach, he has to find out which species prowl its waters and then track their movement. We're going to put our listening station. Here's the red dot. Let's have a look at what this buffer says. That means tagging we sharks with radio transmitters we know and setting up a listening station, station in the bay. Pick up any tag sharks in a radius of one kilometer. So what I'm thinking is we put the VR2 in the block system smack bang in the mouth of that bay. There's no point deploying this equipment if it's not going to pick up sharks close to the beach. Sure. I mean, that's the whole focus of this research project. Each shark's tag will emit a unique signal, so he'll know which species enter the bay. This tagging project will reveal critical results over coming months. But the most important information for him will be right beneath his boat. Right now, 
It's the height of summer. Shark attack season. They have to find exactly the right spot to place the listening station. If they miscalculate, sharks could sneak in and out of the bay undetected. The unit consists of a heavy steel anchor with the receiver mounted above. We can see it's activated, we've got the red flashing light. And this is the thing that's going to pick up any tag shark that comes within 500 meters of the Port St. John's beach. So I think we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. They found the right spot, but now they have to assemble the station by hand. Which means joining the treacherous sharks of Second Beach in their own domain. The divers both wear shark pods, protective oceanic devices that emit an electric field. Sharks can pick up electromagnetic information, and the pod is said to be a repellent. But deep down, Matt knows that worldwide it's had mixed results. Now it's his only defense. Shapes glide on the edge of the gloom. As they descend, the water gets dirtier and dirtier. The divers can't see each other at times. The surge is extreme. They're thrown around. In the bad visibility, they operate by feel, working as quickly as possible. Down here, the sharks have every advantage. smell, hear, and sense the divers without needing to see them. Eventually, the job is done, and they head for the surface. But the men aren't out of danger until they're back in the boat. Tiger shark arrives. Then disappears into the gloom. Maybe the pod has worked. They make a break for the surface. They have to get back on the boat quickly. While down below, the listening station is active. Now comes the really hard part, catching sharks and attaching transmitter tags. Matt expects to find bull and tiger sharks implicated in some of the attacks. But it's anyone's guess what else is in the deep. He's delving into unknown territory. No one has ever done a shark survey at Second Beach. On the first clear day, the crew heads out. If Matt hopes to solve the shark attacks at Second Beach, 
He has to find out which species prowl its waters and then track their movement. They're off to an encouraging start. Sharks in a feeding frenzy just off Second Beach. It's a great opportunity to set up. Matt gets the first drumline ready. The floats, anchored to the seafloor, keep the bait from drifting away. The sturdy line can support the weight of three grown men. To tempt the sharks away from their feeding, the team douses the bait with anchovy oil. The bait slips onto huge hooks attached to a steel cable that sharp teeth can't bite through. It works. In no time, they have a bite. But it's not what Matt expects. It's one of the winter feeders that visit Second Beach, still here in the middle of summer. A dusky shark. They've got to be careful that it doesn't puncture the inflatable boat. It's not high on the list of man-eaters, but it has a history of attacking humans, so it earns a tag. Their first shark released. Almost immediately, a second drum line is pulled under. The crew has no idea what they've hooked into. It's big, and it reveals itself to be an even bigger surprise. It's a huge thresher shark an open ocean species that uses its long tail to herd and stun shoals of small fish. Threshers are typically found far from shore, out in the deep ocean. They don't often venture close to the beach. Second Beach is obviously a hotspot for a number of shark species, even home to the weird thresher. Threshers don't come up against humans that often, but they have been implicated in four attacks worldwide. A specimen this size could pose a danger to swimmers at Second Beach. So Matt tags it. Good. Free. It's still the first day of fishing, and they've already tagged two unexpected and potentially dangerous sharks. One more. <laughs> and that was spell hooked as well, eh? They've barely reset their lines before a monster shark takes the bait. I'm suspect. A three meter bull shark, the species that's claimed at least three victims. Exactly the shark Matt hoped to catch. Tracking the movement of this shark might help pinpoint when the beach is most dangerous. But right now, it's the crew that's in danger. The shark could rip the inflatable to shreds. 
Since bull sharks swim up rivers, Matt can't use an external radio tag. It could snag on submerged branches and debris. So in a simple surgical procedure, he implants an internal tag. With the unit safely in, the shark swims free. It's been a successful day's fishing. Matt checks the signals of his tagged sharks, gathering the first data for his movement study. It'll take several months, but eventually he hopes to see a pattern to the sharks' comings and goings. It's January, midsummer. It's been a full year since the last attack. People hit the beach to escape the heat. But most play it safe by not venturing too far into the water. Gidi, 25 years old, has come here with his friends. He's one of about a hundred people playing in the waves. Somehow, he's singled out. Attacked in waist-deep water, he fights the shark for five agonizing minutes. Eyewitnesses watch the attack unfold right in front of them. This time, the shark lets him go. but he never makes it to the hospital. He is the sixth person to die on the sand of Second Beach in the last five years. Bite marks reveal a bull shark. The fourth such attack. The tiger shark has been ID'd for one. One attack offers no clues, so duskies and threshers might be in the mix. But Dr. Matt Dickens' work is not yet done. The recent attack puts new urgency to their mission. They'll need to tag as many dangerous sharks as possible. They set the lines once again. A monster takes a bite, pulling down a 15-gallon float. They never even catch a glimpse before it breaks loose. I do not believe it, Barry. <laughs> 16 0 hook. That's bait. That is straightened. Oh, I've never seen that before. I tell you what, we're going to need a bigger boat. It's a big shot. That's enormous. All right, let's get kitted up, bigger hooks up. Suddenly, another drum line gets dragged off. But this time, the shark shows itself. And it's totally unexpected. A great white. The world's most feared man-eater. Here, 
just off Second Beach. They normally stick to colder waters. They call in another boat for help. The fishing gear isn't up to the task. The predator breaks free. One of the Second Beach attack victims disappeared without a trace. A big great white could have eaten him. The discovery of this shark reveals a startling fact about Second Beach. During the summer months, there isn't just an abundance of sharks, there's also a huge diversity of sharks. Port St. John's is like a shark magnet, attracting a variety of different species. The sharks find everything they need here. Some come to hunt in the murky water. Others are drawn to breed. Matt has just begun his research. More clues and more sharks are likely still out there. Many variables conspire here to create one perfect storm scenario. The perfect place for shark attacks, if ever there was one. But shark attacks need more than just sharks. They need people, too. As the surf school and the lifeguard station were set up, the beach became more popular. And so the attacks began. Not one victim survived these bizarre, aggressive encounters. Something else must be pushing the sharks past the brink. Matt has one favored conclusion, that the trigger doesn't come from the sea, but from land, where development creates tasty effluent, which runs into the sea, which leads the hunting sharks right to the only beach where everyone swims. So unwittingly, people could be summoning the sharks here. Not by drumming. Not through animal sacrifices. But through the ordinary act of living by the ocean and swimming in the wrong place at the wrong time. Dr. Matt Dickens' shark tracking study will take more time to reveal when the sharks are hunting in the bay. But his early research has already delivered a clear message. If you want to catch apex predator sharks, go fishing at Second Beach. If you want to swim or surf in the ocean in midsummer, go somewhere else.